So uh, this is the first in a series of conversations between artists who are fellows of Ballinglen and have been to Valley Castle on residency. Each artist will choose an artist to speak with about their work. Um, I've chosen Logan Grider. So hi, Logan. Um, very nice to see you. Uh, you were here in 2015. Yes. Yeah. And you were, you were here with your family um, and you did a lot of collecting. Um, and I was wondering if the piece that is now in the archive that you sent for the archive for the permanent collection, if that relates in any way at all to the work that you made while you were here. Uh, I think in spirit it does. So like I, I came to Ballycastle with, and to Ballinglen with no idea of what I was gonna do really. I mean, I packed, I was worried about the, um, them confiscating my paint, for instance. So I just packed a gouache set and some watercolors and rolled up some paper and that was it. And um, so, but I think much like the only, the only other residency I've done was Skowhegan. So both Ballinglen and Skowhegan, the thing that they shared in common for me was that like uh, disoriented me in a great way. Like I had been working on these very labored, heavy, large encaustic paintings back in Philadelphia. And when I went to Ballinglen, I think my intention was to make watercolors along the same vein, more, more or less studies on paper that I could then take back to the studio and work out. And, uh, instead, I discovered the beach and all that plastic, and um, which I guess if you haven't, for those the people that are watching this, if they haven't been there, they're, they're not going to understand why it's so incredible because we have plastic all over the states too. But, our plastic is of low quality for some reason on the beach. I don't know what it is. It's all netting or water bottles. Um, we plastic. might get your good plastic because with the currents, that's what we might be getting is your I, good heavy plastic. I think your buoys are pla hard plastic over there. Here there's still foam. Okay. Um, the buoys get broken up. And, so the, and then the sea does a number on them and like softens the color and there was something about the color that was obvious and then I had two my jack was three at the time and Cole was just over one one year old and um, so they helped me scavenge the beach at low tide and then I just I think much I probably alarmed some people at the foundation because the studio started to smell like the beach but I just started bringing home the plastic and looking at it uh, I think in, in, in that way and like the way that let, leading like letting curiosity lead the studio work versus like um, me controlling all, yeah. you, know, all you know making studies making big paintings laboring for many many sometimes years over these paintings that then they lose all of their like all their oomph. everything that was fresh about them from the beginning gets sucked out of them so and this happens to me routinely. Like I'm in these like ebbs and flows where I work something to death, and then uh, opening up and ch and ch you know changing materials is a big part of it. Changing an approach to making things. So I think giving myself permission just to play around with plastic in the studio. I mean, a big. I by the end of the residency, I was I had cleaned up your beach pretty well, and then I also I had um, become an expert in adhesives because. It's no joke welding plastic together with different types of adhesives. So I, I can't remember the, the hardware store in Ballina that I used to go to, but um, I, I bought every adhesive they had. Uh, and you eventually found one. You eventually found one. And so I think when I came home, well, actually, I know what happened when I came home is I had a big, uh, kind of a big pivotal moment. I mean, my, my gallery dealer died, the gallery closed. Um, I had all these big paintings that felt like heavy and obnoxious and kind of pretentious. So I got rid of all those paintings, just felt great, scrapped them all. Wow. And then, That's brave. Yeah, well, no, it just felt practical because I, I don't have a very large studio either. I wasn't going to, it was going to, it was a bad idea to keep them around. So then I, yeah, I started uh, giving myself some permission to get off of the uh, one plane of, of yeah. painting space and see what happens. I've always been interested in um, Syrian reliefs, in particular in early medieval reliefs. Like, um, so relief is like a kind of a potential like liminal space between painting and sculpture where uh, 
space can be physical, but can also be an illusion of space at the same time. So it seemed like a perfect, I mean, I'm not making work on that level, but it's an interesting problem to work on. So, so the sculpture, trying to make a, a painting space that's sculptural where both ends kind of hold. So color is a big part of that, like in the painting that's at the Bowen that was a very early one. I think that was the second one I, I made. And it's really kind of like one plus one equals two. It's there's a painting space, there's a sculpture, and then hopefully they make this third thing. Yeah. Uh, so they, they're, that one, I think the color is really important in order to counter the weight of the carved space. And the name of it. Yeah. Yeah. Server. I, um, I had been, you know, I just was reading a lot about the, this was all about all about the, you know, information security scandals and all this, um, a private email accounts and all of these things in the news. And I just, I like, I respond to words as, so all my titles, they don't have direct meaning or representation. It's not, I wasn't making a painting of a, of a private server in terms of like a computer space. I just love the, the, the multiple meanings of private server. I love this class and this uh, double meanings can go on there. So and I also just love the way the word looks visually like the letters. Yeah. We had, um, we were fortunate to be able to have uh, some young people in, uh, we were doing research into how they can interact with the museum, the new museum here. And your piece had just arrived. So it was out um, ready to be photographed um, when they were there in, in December. And we spent a long time looking at it and lots of opinions and they needed to see the back of it. So, which was, which was, which was great. The fact that it wasn't hanging on a wall, we could actually show them the back of it, you know, and the side of it. And yeah, um, they wanted to, um, they preferred it upside down. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. That was a practical problem. I mean, there are practical problems when you build things, you know, I, I, I have a lot of empathy for sculptors because they have like real problems. Painters don't have real problems. We have, we're, we create our own problems, but like you, if you put that thing upside down, it'll fall over, right? Cause it's that big bat block of, that's a solid chunk of basswood in the bottom left corner. So it's extremely heavy or bottom right corner. Yeah. So it's, it'll be top heavy. Yeah, putting them together. I have a, ta a table saw at home with a demolition blade. So I frequently take the paintings back home and put them through the saw or the band saw and rebuild them and then bring them back. So they, the backs are atrocious. They look like, um, they look like something that's gone through like the worst orthopedic surgery imaginable. And sometimes I have to, res I think in that one, I did have to, to I had to use, um, you know, different types of bracing, metal bracing maybe in order to, to make it substantial so it won't just fall apart. Yeah, I, uh, we do appreciate how you um, put a, a marker line around where all the nails are, 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 are the screws are sticking through. So that, I, I just, uh, I do like to, ex to excavate work sometimes. So it was, it was, it was a pleasant part of, of looking at the work and seeing the work for the first time, you know. Yeah, well, that also had a practical, I mean, that was also for me because there are a few paintings I grabbed because they stay on the racks forever. I mean, I still have paintings that are kicking around the studio from 2015, 2016, these, these relief paintings. And I forget that I put a half inch screw through a quarter inch board and, you know, right under the lip of the board. So it catches, you know, it gets that sweet spot right between your nail and your finger. Yeah, yeah. And so has, has work in this way has it changed your relationship with the, the finishing or the, the what you might call overworking of, of the work? Um, well, I'm, I, like I said about the ebbs and flows, I think what happens is I've, I lose, this is part of the benefit of teaching too, is that I have to remind myself. You know, I think a good teacher is somebody who's like consistently learning and learning just as much from their students as they are like giving information back. And so I, I'm, you know, I've, I, one of the things that happens with overworking is I typically work kind of opaquely. I mean, I, I use translucent color, but 
as the opacity builds up and they become more physical on the surface, I usually lose the light. And so when the light no longer passes through the color and hits the support and comes back, it just bounces off the support and comes back. So it's flat. So I'm trying, I, th I think I off, I'm, I've been like resorting to recoding with lead white or sanding down drastically, letting the support dry and then passing over another color. And, and part of that is I'm learning from the watercolors I continue to make. I'm also making paintings that are all made out of cutoffs. So they're like the size of my hand, like none of the reliefs are bigger than my hand. Yeah. Uh, that helps. Yeah. Is that intentional that the reliefs are that, are that hand size? No, it's just anything. I'm such a, I'm so pragmatic that anything bigger than that, I would like to reuse for something else. So okay. I have this, I haven't shown them at all. Like, no, I, they don't, people don't come down to the studio in Swarthmore and I don't, uh, I haven't made a lot of efforts at this point to get the work out there, but I have a, I have a fantasy that someday they'll be interested in the work and I'll be able to put the little ones in a box and just mail them to people. Whereas the big ones need a truck. So yeah, part of it is very practical. Yeah. But you know, that they're, they're very gnarly, as you know, from the one in the Fowling Glen, they're not, beautiful objects on it you know they're they're worked in the i never thought i'd be making shape shaped canvas paintings quote unquote like i've never when i was a student i there's nothing more that i hated than abstract painting and nothing more and more than that i definitely hated anything that wasn't that was shaped i thought shaped canvas painters were completely on their own boat in the middle of the ocean so, so now i'm yeah, they're not finished. The edges are kind of a problem. The physical edges, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's great. Well, thank you for uh, for talking yeah. with me about about your work. I, yeah. I, uh, I I would love to see more. I'd love I'd love to have a studio visit. So maybe someday. Well, I'd love to get back over there. That's what I want to figure out how to do. Yeah, I don't know how that's possible. I told Randall I would be in a boat. If we, I, we have a 16 foot canoe, just, and now that I'm three, Jack is like a little man now, so he could really help me paddle. <laughs>